you for that bingo thing? Can yeah. I, can I get a picture with you for that bingo thing that they had at, um, downstairs? Let's do it afterwards. Okay, cool. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello. I'm on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I got distracted for a second. So, I wanted to do this talk in a smaller room, somewhere like 710 or so, but I asked Diana too late, and she said, well, we have no slots in the schedule. And, but she said, oh, there's always some speaker who cancels, so we'll stick you in a canceled slot. And I said, well, I don't want such a large audience because this is, this is kind of a very high technical topic and I'm afraid that people will sort of not understand it. And she said, well, sure, we'll, 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 we'll still find, we'll find you a canceled slot and we'll put someone else's name on it and then you'll just sort of <laughs> show up. And so a couple weeks before the conference, she emailed me and she said, well, nobody's canceled yet and we've got to print the, the, the program, so can we do plan B? We'll, we'll, we'll make an extra slot for you at the end of the conference. And I still thought, oh, sure, yeah, by, the, by then everybody's tired and they're going home or they're already on their flight. So I was expecting like 200 people who are really into type theory here, but <laughs> well, okay, you're all into type theory. Thank you so much. So got this out of the way. If you want to see that logo again, it's somewhere here on the wall. So uh, I, I always like to start with ancient history, like Grandpa tell again the story about when you found that potato shaped like uh, the baby Jesus. So in 2000, which is pretty ancient history for Py from Python, uh, there was something called a type sig. It, it actually lived from 98 to 2002, and then it died a sad death. But in 2000, and I, I found this talk back, it's still somewhere on python.org, I had this proposal for type annotations, that, and it ju looks just like what I'm now finally going to propose to put into the language. But it didn't go anywhere, because there were other proposals and, and sort of we didn't understand what it was good for and we had more important things to deal with like Unicode. So a couple years later in 2004, uh, 2005, I started blogging about this stuff again and I guess I had sort of heard about Java generics because I, I, I had some little code examples somewhere in the blog where I would define the generic function that sort of takes two items of two arguments of type T and it returns a T. And I also had this notion of, well, you can have a list of T or abstract data types like iterable of T. And that's all exactly like what we're now finally proposing, except then I was using parentheses instead of square brackets, which is a huge step forward. Uh, but I didn't know that. A little after that, sort of, I was still very excited about that idea, but I couldn't get sort of the right shape for it, and, and people had all sorts of counter proposals, and I thought, well, okay, these, these type hints are very complicated, and that they, they need to bake a little longer, but let's at least put something in the language so that we can give people a, an opportunity to experiment, and that was PEP 3107, a function annotations. And so you could actually write all those examples, but you would have to sort of define the meaning for that yourself, because the function annotations have syntax but no meaning. Uh, more recently, uh, two PyCons ago, uh, I met a PhD student from Cambridge who was working on actually a Python-like language where he was going to uh, do type checking. And I talked him into changing the syntax of his language so that it was actually just regular Python. All he had to do is come up with the right syntax to put in those annotation slots. Uh, and he went off and got his degree and all that. And oh, oh now he's also working with me at Dropbox. And then, but that, that was still fairly sort of interesting curiosity, 
But last summer at EuroPython, Bob Ippolito, who's also a big name in the Python world for very long, gave three recommendations for things that Python could learn from Haskell. Actually, maybe it was from Haskell and Erlang. And I forget what the third one was. The second one was completely inactionable. It was something like uh, we should have immutable data types only. But the f his first recommendation was let's take MyPy and run with it, and let's do it. And so uh, I emailed Yuka, let's meet about this, let's see what we can do. There was a Dropbox hack week. Uh, other people got interested, like uh, Lucas Langa, and he sort of drafted a pap that just fell in our lap. And now here we are, and, and we're, I think we're this close to having a solid proposal that we'll introduce in Python 3.5. So, so what, what is this proposal? I think that sort of at the, the really high level, there are three parts to it. There is a separate program, which is a type checker, for example, MyPy, but there are other people working on competing type checkers. And a type checker is like, is something that is more close to a linter than to a Python interpreter. So as a developer, you get to choose which checker and when to run it and where you, what you do with the output. The second leg of the proposal is function annotations. There is now a notation for what you put in the annotations that sort of defines what the types of the arguments and the return uh, type are and how they relate to each other. And the third, of, the third leg of the, argue, of the proposal, which actually is, is very pragmatic, is that many times you cannot actually put your stubs in your code for various reasons. Maybe it's your, not your code, maybe it's written in C, maybe it needs to be compatible with Python 2. And so it's also going to be possible to put, stu to put, put type annotations in separate files, which we call stub files. And more about that a little later, but why, why do we want a static type checker? Well. In an ideal world, if you talk to sort of the people who are into static typing, and usually they want it in their compiler, but in the end, the reason is that static type checks find certain bugs uh, sooner, like before you deploy your code, which is good uh, if you annotate your code. And in the Python world, we, we sort of, we have lots of other ways of catching bugs, and there are plenty of bugs that don't get caught by type systems, so this is not a panacea, but some bugs actually do get found sooner if you have type annotations and you check against them. It turns out that who, the larger your project is, the more lines of code you have, but especially the more people you have working on that project and the longer your project is stretched over time, the more these kind of things, tools like linters and type checks actually help it helps new engineers spelunk old code that sort of only one engineer who no longer works at the company would still understand otherwise. And it turns out that large teams actually already have some form of static analysis running that they found that even without type annotations, uh, static analysis can help them find bugs sooner or do other things like yeah, well, find bugs sooner, sorry. <laughs> That's what it all comes down to, right? <laughs> Different kinds of bugs. And so there are also people who are actually building products. Uh, but so these static analysis tools currently work OK, at least, without type hints. Why do you want the type hints? Well, Python is incredibly dynamic. and it turns out that there are many, many idioms in Python that actively work against static analysis, that just sort of get in the way of static analysis, because you sort of, you read a string from a file, or you, you ask the user for, to type a string, and then you evaluate it, and then you run with whatever object that evaluation returned, then the type checker has no way to figure out what that type is. And then, all the rest of the code that uses that value also doesn't know what the type is. So often there are ways to, to sort of help, the, help type checkers 
to, to keep track of what, what types are actually in use, in the, in the sort of in the programmer's mind. That's often what it, what it cares, what, it, what, it matter, what matters most. And so it turns out that because type hints are important to represent what's in the programmer's mind, they're also quite useful as documentation. And yes, they get out of date, but that's where the static type checker helps. The static type checker actually checks whether the, ty the type annotations that you put in your program match the code that you put in your program, which is a big advantage over putting the type information in doc strings, because nobody checks that the doc strings are still correct. Uh, it also turns out that everybody is uh, building IDEs that have all sorts of handy uh, stuff in them, and it's very useful for an IDE to be able to know what the type of a particular variable or argument is, so that when you hit the dot and then you ask the IDE, what could I type here that starts with an A? And it can know that if it's a list, that append is a pretty popular choice, but if it's not a list, append is probably not one of the choices. Uh, IDEs also like to put squiggly red or green lines under your code to help you sort of catch type errors early. So all these things, uh, oh yeah, let, let, let me quote a statistic, someone uh, who works for one of the big Python IDE developers mentioned at the language summit that they can correctly infer the type of about 50 to 60% of all expressions occurring in typical code which means that nearly half of the expressions, they cannot infer the type. And that's where the type hints would be useful. So why do you want these stub files? Why do you not always want to put your types, your type hints in your annotations? Well, the original reason why stub files were invented was that you somehow have to annotate the standard library, and much of the standard library, especially the built-ins, is all implemented in C. And you can't expect the poor type checker to also parse the C code and understand what's going on there. Because at this, in the C code, everything is an object. Wow, great. Uh, it turns out there are many other useful use cases where stubs are handy, like third-party packages. You don't really want to sort of go modify the source code of a third-party package, because you would have to do it again for the next release. And, there are all sorts of reasons. There is legacy code where there are places where that code is used where the type hints would be in the way, like, for example, Python 2 compatibility. There are also reasons that maybe, maybe the owner of the code just doesn't want you to put the type hints in. There are plenty of people who don't like type hints and they don't want you to mess with their code. But if you are using their package, you might still want to sort of behind their back or with sort of, with, at least without their explicit agreement, create a stub file that describes the types of their particular module or package uh, so that you can type check your own code better. Plus, uh, it takes a long time to develop stubs, and we don't want to wait until we have stubs for the whole standard library. So we hope that actually people will start creating more stubs for more standard libraries modules after 3.5 has already been released. And yet, a lot of people, when you sort of present this, this idea to them, they're, they're not just lukewarm, they're actively resentful. Python is dynamically typed. We don't want, type we don't want to have to write types in our programs. Well. Correct, you don't have to do this. I'm just adding this so that those people who have large code bases where they think that they can use type hints uh, and that, that will make their static analysis better uh, can use it. And it's, it's useful to have a standard notation so that everybody can sort of share stubs and agree on what those stubs mean. But very much, Please, please understand this is optional. I'm not telling you you have to put stubs in. I'm not even asking you to put, I'm not even asking politely to put stubs in. I'm telling you there is a proposal for stubs, sorry, for type, type hints. 
Use it if you think you'll benefit from it. Ignore it if you don't care. You can run the type checker, or you can choose not to run a type checker. That's completely up to you. Also, in Python 3.5, we're making very sure that it's not going to break anybody's code, and it's entirely provisional, which, which actually means, provisional in this case means that we can still tweak the API in certain backward incompatible ways if we find that we made a mistake. And that's also important because we don't, we don't want to sort of paint ourselves completely into a corner, but we do want to release something at 3.5. So I think I already said most of this. Currently, a couple of companies have their own sort of notion of stubs that they, they maintain themselves. Uh, and I think it's just a good idea to have a PEP and accept that PEP, of course, so that everyone can say, OK, the issue of the syntax of annotations and stubs is settled. Now we can all compete on who has the best type checker or the best type inferencer or the best IDE. And some people like type systems. So. If you were to go back to those old blog posts and uh, the type sig proposals in 2000, you'll find that there was a lot of hope where we thought, oh, if we put the type annotations in, we, the compiler can generate more efficient code and our code will magically run faster. Well, on the one hand, if you want your code magically to run faster, you should probably just use PyPy, which works just fine without type hints. Uh, on the other hand, there are certain systems like Cython that can perhaps use type hints just as they're standardized, or maybe they'll have their own idea, and then we'll have to talk more. But we'll, we'll see how this works out. But I'm not yet holding my breath for faster code due to type hints. However, I am expecting fewer bugs and uh, happier programmers due to type hints. So again, some of you have probably read PEP 3107 or the corresponding documentation and gone to town defining your own type checking system or maybe command line parsing system based on the type, the function annotation syntax. And your notation looks nothing like PEP 484. Well, uh, the best I can promise is that it is totally in your right. Uh, your code will still work in 3.5. It may not please a type checker, but you don't have to run the type checker on that particular file or module or package. If you want to peacefully coexist with type checkers, the PEP actually also has a standard notation for turning off type checking. And the simplest uh, form is a decorator that you can put on an individual function. <clears throat> so in much of the rest of the talk, I'm, I'm going to try and explain what these type hints actually look like if they're not as simple as this is an int and that is a string. There's even a tiny bit of theory. Uh, but I get confused by the theory myself sometimes. And it, it ends with a bunch of stuff that is necessary if you actually want to use this in practice. So basics of what, uh, what we call gradual typing. Uh, it's gradual because you can have type hints in some code and no type hints in other code. And Something useful needs to happen when annotated code and unannotated code meet. And the idea is that the annotated code must conform to its own type hint. So if you, if you say this is an int and that is an int, and then you do something with them, that operation that you do on those two arguments better be something you can actually do with ints. Otherwise, the type checker will be unhappy and tell you. On the other hand, the code that you didn't annotate, the type checker is going to be silent because that's dynamic code. And sort of by 
by the definition of the idea of gradual typing, an annotated code is not checked. And there is actually a special type in the type hinting system named any, which means shut up. And not annotating a function is almost the same as annotating it with any all around. Uh, technically, that's not entirely true, so don't hold me too much to it. But that's sort of a first approximation uh, interpretation of gradual typing. So this anything is actually a pretty strange duckling. And I, I don't know in which, it's sort of how you draw your, your class diagrams. So I don't know what's at the top or what's at the bottom. But I can tell you that any is both at the top and at the bottom of your class tree. Because that's the definition of any. And so it's, let's say that object is at the top of your class tree and everything that derives from object and everything is below that, then any is at the top because any value x is an instance of the type any. And any class c is a subclass of the class any. However, and this is completely, I mean, so this first bullet, any behaves just like object because all those things are true if you use object instead of any. However, because any is also at the other side of your class tree, any is actually a subclass of every other class. And that is, that is the magic of any, that it also actually causes some trouble with is subclass if you take it literally, because normally is subclass is transitive. Is if A is a subclass of B and B is a subclass of C, then we know that the A is a subclass of C. But if, if something in the middle of a chain like that is any, then you can't sort of go through that any because otherwise you'd end up with every, subclass, every class as a subclass of every other subclass. And that would be a very useless type system. So technically, we're not using, we shouldn't be saying subclass, we should say is consistent with. And this terminology, I believe, is due to Jeremy Seek of Indiana University. And if you just Google for what is gradual typing, you'll find his excellent blog post, which also has a few good things to say about dynamic versus static typing in general. But there is a little definition where you say some type is consistent with another type, uh, which essentially means values of the first type can be assigned to variables of the, uh, the second type. And this relationship is not in general symmetric or transitive. Uh, but it is mostly that because what follows from being consistent with is the regular subclass property. However, is consistent with also works for any in the opposite direction. So any is consistent with t, and t is consistent with any. And this is true for every t. But you cannot conclude from this that every t is consistent with every other t, because the relationship is defined as not transitive. And that's as much theory as I can manage to try to explain. <clears throat> but read the blog post, it's much better. So back to sort of practical stuff. There is actually in the whole proposal, there's really only one thing I'm proposing to actually put in the next CPython distribution as part of the CPython standard library, and that's the typing module. There will be no type checking as part of CPython. There will be no new syntax for typing. Every syntax I've shown you so far is actually already valid Python syntactically. All you have to do is overload get item in a few odd places. We will also not put annotations in any other standard library modules. And we may sort of in 3.6, we may change our mind about that, but for 3.5, typing.py is the only thing we want in the standard library, and thereby sort of the notion that there is now a standard notation which is defined by what's in typing.py and what's in the PEP. 
So if you want to use any or a number of other magical objects like unions or dictionaries and lists that can be subscripted with types, you have to import them from typing. <coughs> However, that doesn't mean that you necessarily always need to start by import typing. Here's a simple class example that, well, it's, it's, it's pretty silly class. I guess it's a charting class with uh, you in the interface defined by someone who had never defined a class before. So there's this, it would, actually I wrote it. <laughs> uh, set a label takes two arguments that are floats and one that's a string and it returns a bool. Maybe that, that tells you whether it actually succeeded in setting a label. And apparently there's a get nearest method that asks for the nearest label to a particular point on the chart. There are also a couple of helper functions. Those are, those are not part of the class. They're not methods, they're just functions. They don't have a self argument as you can tell. But they are annotated make label takes a chart object. So we see that user defined classes can also show up in uh, type in positions. And well, it does, it actually uh, calls the set label function. The type checker can figure out that this is actually correct code. That set label A is correct because set label takes a string and so on. Uh, get labels. So it takes a list of points and it just says that the points variable is a list. It's a built-in list type. And it also tells us that it returns a list, which is all very partial information, because actually, if you look at the code, it calls get nearest for two points. So apparently, the list of points is actually a list of tuples of two floating point values. And so what it returns is a list of strings. But you can't really tell that from the code here, and the, the type checker would not be able to validate that you didn't make a mistake with that. So here is a little bit of extra stuff that you can add. Uh, we're going to import the capital list and capital tuple from the typing module, and we're going to use those. Uh, I don't have a pointer, that's OK. So we have. No, we redeclare the get labels function as taking a list of tuples where there are actually tuples of two floating points. And it returns a list of strings. Uh, now, that function doesn't actually care that the input is a list. It can work with any iterable. So let's import iterable from the typing module. And then we can say it's an iterable of tuples. And these are all actually working examples. So, but what exactly did we do here? Well, typing.iterable, we said from typing import iterable, so there's some, something defined in typing named iterable, which is almost the same thing as the collections ABC named iterable. Uh, and that particular collection pretty much defines one piece of behavior, which is that it has an under under iter method. Uh, and so the typing.iterable does the same thing, but it also lets you specify what that, that iter uh, actually contains or returns. Uh, for various pragmatic reasons, mostly having to do with not wanting to modify the C Python implementation at all, uh, typing.list is the moral equivalent of uh, the built-ins list function, or type actually. But again, you can specify what kind of uh, items, what well, the type of the items is. Tuple, uh, again, re represents or resembles the built-in tuple function class. Uh, Typing.tuple is actually a little bit more special because we usually don't want to think of tuples as a variable immutable sequence of axes. We probably think of the typical tuple, like in this example, of it's a two tuple of two floats. Or maybe uh, it's a tuple of two integers and a string. And so that's what you can define with uh, the tuple class. Now, maybe in the future we can just write lowercase list. Uh, but 
for now in 3.5 in this proposal because we want to have just the single typing module that works in Python 3.5, but actually also in previous versions. Uh, you have to import that thing from, the, from typing. Oh, and the way all these things work is there is a meta class that overloads get item, but you don't really have to know about that. That's just sort of, if you're surprised that you take a class and you put square brackets behind it, if you're surprised that that's valid Python, that previous slide was why. Uh, but, well, there's, there's, there's a sad terminological problem in Python, which I am personally responsible for, which is that we've always done a terrible job of distinguishing between types and classes. And for example, the function to get the class of an object is actually named type. And well, there are historical reasons, but for if you're talking about type checking and type hints, it actually makes a little bit more sense to be careful about your terminology. So in cases where it actually matters, we will say class when we mean a concrete implementation and type when we mean something that is more in the mind of the type checker. This again is pretty subtle and we may have to iterate on this terminology, but this is what it is currently. Anyway, so here is, I believe, a complete list of things that you can use in type hints and that type checkers are expected to understand. So you can put classes in there, could be built-in classes like object or float, or could be user-defined classes like chart, either in your own code or in some third-party package. Then there are these generic types, which are things like list, square bracket, int, or a dictionary with a string and an int, where the string is the key and the int is the value. Abstract classes like iterable. Uh, then there are a bunch of magic things like any and union, and it turns out that tuple and callable are also pretty magic. And then there is a way of defining your own generic types, do-it-yourself generic types, and show that later, hopefully I'll have time for that. So union is a very basic type that says it could either be this or that type. So for example, the union of int, float, and string, uh, those are all things that you can add to themselves. One very common case is union of something and none, actually something or the type of none because the arguments for union should be types. We let you actually specify none also. But either an int or none, or either a chart or none, or either something or not, not something is so common that we have a special notation optional. And that sort of, that helps the human reader probably more than it helps the type checker because the type checker just reduces that to a union and works with that. So I mentioned that tuple was a little bit special Tuple actually has a variable number of parameters and uh, sort of each of those is, describes a different position in the tuple. So tuple of int int stir is a tuple of length three where the first two items are ints and the last is a string. Of course, we got a lot of pushback and there was, was an endless thread about, well, but is a tuple not really just a uh, immutable sequence? And well, often we use a tuple as an immutable sequence, so as a sort of compromise, you can say tuple of float comma dot dot dot, and that's literally three dots, and that is also already existing Python syntax, I think, way back since in Python 2 that was introduced to help the numerical Python people with certain types of slices. So that is what you would write if you meant a tuple really as an immutable sequence of floats. Uh, more stuff, again, this, is, this has been a fairly controversial way of, of naming callable. Some people wanted to call it function, but not all callables are functions. There have been different proposals for how to separate the argument list from the return type. 
Uh, in the end, I, I looked at all the different proposals and this still came out as the sort of the most straightforward and least error prone. So you have a callable that takes three arguments, these are the types, and it has a certain return type. If you have a callable that takes like keyword arguments or is var args or has other strange things, currently the PEP484 notation cannot actually describe that because the, the proposals for describing all the possible signatures that you could have in Python dev syntax got very complicated because the, the options are, the, the possibilities are endless. We didn't want to, to sort of, callable is really usually used for very simple callbacks that are almost always called with a fixed number of positional parameters and nothing else. If you have a callback that is more complicated than that, you can say three dots instead of the argument list, and then the type checker is just supposed to uh, take a break from that argument list. Uh, generic types, how do you make your own generic types? Uh, you have to de define type variables. That's a little clunky. In Java, the type variables are introduced by special syntax, but in Python, the syntax is not all that special. So you have to tell Python, I'm defining a type variable. But usually, well, most people never get to, to, the, to the point where they actually need to define a generic class, because this is usually only needed when you're defining a new container type. If you are defining a new container type, uh, you may have to define one or two type variables in an entire module. So it's not much overhead to be forced to actually use that type var function to define those type variables. Uh, and now we can say we have class chart, and apparently this is a variation of the chart I had before where the labels could be of type T, and so we can have a chart of string, but we could also have a chart of a uh, tuple of int and string, which would make every label a tuple of an int and a string, of course. Nevertheless, this is just sort of a watered down version of things you can do in Java. Uh, you can also do this with functions. You can uh, define a generic function without having it inside a generic class. Uh, I don't really care about this detail all that much. Uh, I also have a request for the organizers. Can I go a little over? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will try not to make it too crazy. Uh, here, is, here is one particular example I'd like to show. Let's say we have a function that calls the built-in split. And we try to annotate it, and it takes a line, which is a string, and a separator, which is an optional string, essentially. Uh, and it returns a list of strings. And what the function actually does is it splits the line, but it limits the split to, at most, one uh, split point. Uh, it turns out that that split method also works for bytes, and we would like to express the type of this function so that it's legal for the caller to call split one with a string or with bytes. This is Python 3, of course, where the strings and bytes are different things. So our first attempt, and bear with me, let's say that any stir is a union of string or bytes, which means it can either be a string or a byte. Uh, by the way, this, this is valid. You can define your own type aliases so that you don't have to type so much. So we define our split one function, and now we say the argument is an any stir, and the separator is an optional any stir, and it returns a list of any stirs, and the body is still the same. Sadly, there are two problems with that. The first problem is that the function is actually more strict than what you would think given that signature, because if the line is a string and the separator is a byte, it doesn't actually work. And it turns out that if you feed that to the type checker, the type checker is full of enthusiastic rejection of what you just wrote. <clears throat> so we do something else. We use a type variable. And we, this is a little bit of magic that Yuka actually came up with. We constrain that type variable 
by calling type var with still, type var always needs to take the name of the type variable that you're creating. But now you give it extra positional arguments that are themselves types, uh, although they look like classes. And now this type variable works like a type variable. Any store is just like that T we had earlier, but the type checker also knows that when you call it, so it knows, it knows basically two things. It knows that the line and sep arguments must correspond. They must either be both strings or both bytes. Uh, and they must not be anything else. And so that's how we solve this particular problem. And it turns out, okay, if, if, if we now make the runtime mistake, we get a complaint from the type checker but the function itself is perfectly fine according to the type checker, which is correct, it is perfectly fine. And this is actually such a common case that we have any stir predefined exactly as I, I was written on the previous slide in the typing module. Uh, the constraint is a little bit magical that if any of the arguments is a sub, has, has a type that is actually a subclass of stir, that the type, the type checker reduces that to exactly the, the, the base class that is actually listed in the type variable so that we don't make the mistake of expecting that it will also return that same subclass because often subclasses of stir are very impure and their operations return regular stirs. Uh, I think that was the most complicated part that I wanted to talk about. There's a whole bunch of pragmatic stuff, like if, you have a, if you're defining a container type or say a node for a binary tree, you often need to name, you want to mention the class that, that you're defining in the argument signature for some of the methods. And it turns out that the way C Python works or the way Python is defined, that class object is not actually created and the name node is not actually defined until you've reached the bottom of the class. So the reference, referencing the class in the annotation of one of the methods doesn't work. And as a compromise, you can put string quotes around it and the type checker will just strip the string quotes and parse it that way while C Python or PyPy will just execute it as is and set the string in the annotations variable. Uh, lots of other pragmatic things, like in some cases you want to annotate variables. We don't want to introduce yet. We don't yet want to introduce a syntax for annotating variables in Python 3.5. So as a compromise, again, uh, you can put that in a type comment. Uh, there's a cast function, there's some debate about what the order of the arguments should be. I think I'll just make it the first. Uh, there are some other things like undefined. Uh, I also implemented in the typing module uh, instance and class checking so that if you actually have a, a union of int and stir, you can actually ask, is 42 an instance of that? And it will say yes. And if you ask if 3.15 is an instance of that, it will say no. Uh, stub files, oh yeah, uh, last minute this sort of choice was that we want the stub files to have a different extension. That wasn't clear in the early stages of the proposal, uh, but it is just too handy to be able to have the stub file live in the same directory as the source that it uh, describes, even though that's not always how it works. And so uh, stub files are named PYI. What you put in the stub file is simply class definitions, method definitions, function definitions, uh, but you can leave the bodies of the functions uh, as short as you can, like just put pass everywhere. Because the type checker looks for the signatures, but it doesn't do any type checking otherwise. Overloading. Uh, at some point, we would like to have multiple dispatch, uh, but a good multiple dispatch implementation is really hard and we kind of ran out of time and we don't want to wait for the multiple dispatch implementation to land 
uh, before we can use it in stubs, because in the stand, especially amongst the built-in types and functions, there are a couple of things that really are sort of in dire need of having an overloaded signature. This example is from the bytes class. If you pass get, get item on a bytes object, an integer argument, then it returns an integer. It re returns the byte at that position. But if you pass it a slice, it returns a bytes object, which is the slice of, of bytes at, indicated by that slice. So that's a clear example of overloading. But sort of as a compromise, you can only use overload in stub files. Let's see, what else do we have? Oh yeah, uh, I mentioned this earlier. If you're, if you're already a happy user of type annotations and you have different interpretation of type annotations, you might want to disable them. So you can stick a class or method decorator, uh, no type check, uh, or you can disable it for the whole file by putting type ignore comment at the top. top. You can also probably use a stub file because the type checker will also prefer, always prefer the stub file over the implementation. Let's see what else is there to discuss. There were a whole bunch of rejected alternatives. Uh, the reason I ended up with the current somewhat clunky syntax that you can look up in PEP484 is that it's easy to parse. For example, the angular bracket syntax is notoriously hard to parse because angular brackets are also used for comparison operators. And in Python, sort of, there is no different portion of the syntax where types are used. Types are just possible everywhere because their classes traditionally are just objects. Uh, the current notation has the advantage that there's no new syntax added, so the typing module can actually be used back to Python 3.2 at least. Uh, we didn't need any changes to C code. Uh, we didn't need to make any changes to other standard library modules. Uh, and it's sort of, it's uniform when you see a capitalized word followed by square brackets, you can be pretty sure that we're talking about uh, some kind of type thingy. Now, if, if, if you're one of the 2,000 people in this room who has a strong opinion about type systems, there are probably a few things you don't like about this proposal. Well, uh, it's not perfect, but it will still help you find bugs. What can I say? So how is it, this PEP going to be accepted? Uh, I don't know, it's probably I, I'm hoping to find someone, I have someone in mind, to, but not myself, not one of the PEP authors, that's, that's sort of a big constraint, who is sufficiently independent to give lots of good pushback on this proposal. And that would be the ideal BDFL delegate for this PEP. If you're not familiar with that notion, in general, when there is a PEP and I don't understand the topic, or I'm too closely involved with the creation of the PEP, someone else, some other senior person or knowledgeable person in the Python community needs to sort of volunteer to be the BDFL for that particular PEP so they can have the last say in approving or rejecting it. Uh, Again, it will be provisional, which means that we can still tweak it while 3.5 is already rolled out. And with apologies to the organizers, I don't know if there's time for questions or if we should just go to the closing remarks. No questions, but they can find you. No questions, but come track me down. I will, I will be right here. <laughs>